All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our series, Great Ideas in Psychology. This is part eight. It's going to be about artificial intelligence. But before I get into the material for this part, I want to take a note that we are reaching the midpoint in the series. So the series in total is going to have 20 parts, 20 videos, hopefully over a period of 20 weeks, continuously, consistently, we will see. And uh, at the midpoint, I want to do something special when we reach number 10 in the series. I want to invite you, if you are interested, I would like to invite you to uh, submit something in the form of a comment or a criticism around 300, 500 words, commentary, anything that stood out for you, anything that was important for you, that was interesting, was engaging, thought-provoking, particularly for, from your perspective. I'd like to receive from a few people some comments, some feedback on the, on the series as a whole, on the, the first part of the first half of the series, the first 10 videos. So you send me one thing, one text, and I will pick one of them, one of you, one of the people who writes these comments, and I will send them a hard copy of my book, my 2019 book, Experimental Psychology and Human Agency, as a token of gratitude for your engagement. So we will do that when we reach video number 10. So, but you can prepare uh, by thinking about what we have covered so far in these uh, eight videos, seven, eight videos, including today, eight. As I said, today's topic is artificial intelligence. And the main thing that I want to hammer home, the main thing that I want to emphasize is that artificial intelligence as a general topic can be approached from different distinct perspectives. And depending on what your perspective is, depending on what you're curious about, what you're interested in, you will care about some things. You will have your own style of thinking about AI. And since each perspective is limited and selective, there, are, there will be some things that you don't care about, you will not care about based on that perspective, based on your approach, your angle on the topic of artificial intelligence. I want to specifically highlight the distinction between an engineering or design or computer science perspective and a psychological perspective. A psychological perspective, which is, I believe it's, it's rarely attended to deserves its own its own discussion okay but go to let's go to the to the slides see what i have here we are as i said chapter eight and this is our place in the general map of the course map of the series all right so our questions the questions that we can ask from the perspective of somebody who is designing ai somebody who is within the field, is inside the field of artificial intelligence, not outside it, not a neighboring perspective like psychology of AI or sociology of AI or history of AI. No, Let's say for somebody who is engaged within the field of artificial intelligence, these are some of the questions that they might ask, they might care about. For example, they might ask, what are the methods for creating AI? So what methods can we use in general? They might ask, how can these methods of AI, AI design, be improved, modified, improved? Or what types of problems can be solved with AI? These AI that the artificial intelligence that we design, what can they solve? And what can they not solve? In contrast to that, or in com comparison to that, we have a psychological perspective that is different from the pers perspective of a designer of AI. And we should Keep that, in, keep that distinction in mind because the, the design perspective might be for some of us, for some people, including for some psychologists, might be too exciting, too seductive, too engaging. And sometimes we forget that we had our own initial interest, that we have our own field, our own approach. And our, our approach has distinct interests, can raise distinct questions about this field. Like when you get into a relationship with a romantic partner, Sometimes there's a danger of losing yourself in that romantic partner and forgetting that you have your own interests. And those interests are different from the, the, the interests, curiosities, things that your partner is excited about. So 
when psychology gets into a re- so, so-called relationship, a romantic relationship with another field like computer science, it is important for psychology to maintain its own characteristics and not, not lose itself, not melt into the arms of co- computer science. So a psychologist might ask, can machines think? And what is interesting about this question is, it leads to another and underlying deeper question. What is thinking? We find here that a field like artificial intelligence makes psychology self-aware, more reflective in a way that is good for psychology. Psychology might not initially have that, have any preoccupation with that question, what is thinking, if we all know what thinking is. But the attention to artificial intelligence might lead psychologists to, to realize that the question of thinking is not obvious, doesn't have a clear answer. We don't all know what thinking is. So what is thinking anyway is a connected question to that. We answer that, try to answer that in parallel to the question, can machines think? We want to be clear about answers to both of those questions. What is thinking? What do we mean when we say machines can think? And we also ask, what does AI technology reveal about human intelligence? In the beginning of the chapter, as is probably very appropriate to do, our author, Professor Magadam, brings in Alan Turing and talks about the Turing test. What is a Turing test? I'm sure most people who are watching this video right now are very familiar with the Turing test. But I still want to talk about it because Turing test is a very unique, it has a very unique status. And that unique status, the, the, the unique way it is designed to do a certain job that usually goes unnoticed. Usually when we judge something, our judgment is based on positive evaluations. So if I want to judge, for example, if there are dishes in the dishwasher, I'll go open the dishwasher and I see some dishes inside the machine. And I say, yes, I saw the thing that I was looking for. And I, in my head, I'll have a, have a check mark next to the question. The answer is yes. So that's a positive evaluation. I was looking for something, I see it, and then I say yes. If, if there are no dishes in the dish, dishwasher, I'll say no. But a Turing test is based on a negative evaluation. What do I mean by that? What I mean is the Turing uh, test proposed by Alan Turing, the theorist of uh, computer technology, is based on the boundaries between artificial forms of intelligence and natural forms of intelligence the comparison between human intelligence and machine intelligence. And what Turing says is we have to look for comparisons. We have to look for similarity between human and not and artificial intelligence. And we have to say, yes, machine is intelligence when there is no boundary, when we cannot tell that the boundary between human and machine intelligence. In other words, Turing says machines are intelligent when the boundary between human and machine intelligence is no longer visible, when we no longer can tell what type of intelligence we are facing, we are interacting with. So he said, you put the machine in, in another room and you interact indirectly through a chat box with the artificial intelligence, and we must judge the machine as intelligent if we cannot tell that the thing we are, the agent we are chatting with through the chat box is a machine or another fellow human being. So it is not based on a positive evaluation, a positive judgment. Yes, something we call intelligence is there. I, I, I see it. I notice it. So I hope that uh, shows, that clarifies why the Turing test is, is a special kind of test. It, it, it has a special strange status among the tests, uh, tests of intelligence. That's not how we treat human intelligence, as we discussed in the previous video. So what does that lead us? Where does that lead us? It leads us to the conclusion that Turing's curiosities were not primarily psychological. There is no doubt, there is no debate 
regarding the genius of Alan Turing. I'm not questioning that. What I'm questioning is the re relevance of the Turing test to psychology. Because the Turing test effectively circumvents, ignores, gets past psychological curiosities and, and says, doesn't matter. Let's look at two agents. And if we cannot tell the difference between these two agents, um, we come to the conclusion that they are both intelligent. In a way, Turing, the Turing test is taking for granted the notion of intelligence and the being of intelligence, uh, intelligence agents. Now that we have established that, hopefully, we can turn to questions for psychology. What types of questions we can ask in psychology? So in, a psychologist might begin by looking at method, the details of the method. So unlike the Turing test, a psychologist should ask, what did you do to design this artificial intelligence? What was the method? Is this method, let's refer to it with X, is X a method for designing AI? Then is, next question, is the AI produced by the method X similar to human intelligence? We pay attention both to the method and to the outcome. Is the outcome comparable now to what human intelligence achieves? If not, what have we learned about human intelligence, human psychology? If there are differences, then yeah, that's, that's really exciting. It might not be exciting for computer scientists. It might not be exciting for engineers who have designed the AI. But for psychologists, the difference, the failures of artificial intelligence are equally as exciting as the successes of AI. When there is a discrepancy between these two types of intelligence, psychologists will say, what is the difference between this AI and human intelligence? What is it that the method X missed? What assumptions did we, what wrong assumptions did we hold that we adopted so passionately, so excitedly this, this method of intelligence? So for example, early methods of designing AI were based on propositional, pr propositional knowledge. Propositional no knowledge is a form of knowledge that usually takes the uh, subject predicate form. So every piece of knowledge is about a claim, a proposition. Every piece of knowledge is the relationship between various concepts that the machine has in its store. So we might say, for example, Vienna is the capital city of Austria. This is a piece of propositional knowledge. Napoleon Bonaparte was defeated in the Battle of Waterloo, which took place on June 18th, 1815 in Belgium. So these concepts are enriched the concept Belgium is enriched every time you link a proposition to it. It acquires a new association. And when you ask the machine, if you ask AI, what can you tell us about Austria? What can you tell us about Belgium? It, will, it can give you, based on what propositions it has learned, it, it has stored, it can tell you those information. Now, the limitations of this propositional knowledge. I'm just going through those series of steps. This is a method, presumably, for designing AI. Does this reveal something about human intelligence? Are there differences between this method, the, the intelligence that is designed with this method based on this assumption, based on the assumption that intelligence is primarily or even exclusively propositional? and the performance of a human intelligence. So first attempts at building AI involved entering true statements in a computer database and generating huge, um, massive amounts of data. In addition to these propositions, in, were incorporated. what was incorporated was a set of abstract logical rules. So the machine performs in a way that is consistent, logically consistent. This method is known now to us as GUFI or good old fashioned artificial intelligence because it was um, based on logical rules, logical algorithms, logical consistency, and 
propositions. You can say relatively top-down approach to intelligence. Some critics of this approach have said that GUFI puts too much emphasis and places too much burden on internal processes, internal mechanisms. Rodney Brooks, for example, who you see in this, in this, on this slide, Rodney Brooks said that this approach is like explaining planetary movements, the movements of a planet by saying that there are things going on inside the planet. The planet is deciding, um, deciding to move and stay on this orbit. And there are these computational resources inside the, the planet and the planet is computing at any time uh, to how to change the, the direction or how to not change, maintain a pattern of movement. Of course, that is absurd when we think about planetary movement movements. There are no computational resources inside the planet. Instead, the planet is a part of a system of gravitational uh, forces and relationship between other masses. And because the planet is entangled, is, is, a, is a part of this whole, part of this larger system, it is behaving in that way. Now, Rodney Brooks followed this way of thinking and actually made artificial systems that behave in a very complex way. They can move, they can avoid obstacles, they can take turns. And these designs are not based on propositions. They are not based on rules. They are not based on an, a top-down approach to intelligent behavior. Instead, they are based on very simple uh, design principles that rely on the interaction between the machine and the environment. And they rely a lot on the environment's consistency. So in Rodney Brooks' words, this is a sensory motor coupling approach. You don't, um, you don't design things within the artificial intelligence system. Instead, you are thinking at the level of um, the machine and its environment. And we aim to fit to create a fit between the body of this artificial machine, this machine and the, the physical attributes of the environment. We have in mind the attributes of the environment as well as the actions that we want to implement. So in other words, intelligence is related to the body environment fit, the body environment interaction. Related to this idea is, as you might recall, from our previous video, Robert Sternberg and his criticism of brain theories of intelligence. He said that brain theories of intelligence sometimes forget that intelligent behavior is not inside the brain. It has to do with the interaction between the organism and, and the environment. So we talked about propositional knowledge, the propositional approach to intelligence. Another method is, uh, or another approach is an approach based on associations. So according to this approach, intelligence comes from or arises out of associations we have among concepts. This is comparable to the propositional approach, but it is more bottom up. It is trying to rely on crude, cruder, relatively more crude mechanisms of associations between concepts. And uh, people who rely or pro are proponents of this approach, they emphasize the fact that it is biologically plausible because there are also neural connections. There are connections between our brain cells. So uh, mental associations that are artificially created, created associations in an AI are trying to replicate the essence of human intelligence, namely association among concepts. In our textbook, we read about a major problem in associationists' approach to AI. And that major problem is the problem of compositionality. If what we have are associations and only associations between concepts, then we cannot solve this compositionality problem. What is a compositionality? It is something that humans are obviously capable of. It is the ability to have a rep representation made out of different parts and at the same time grasp the meaning of the parts and the whole grasp the part of uh, the meaning, the significance of parts and the totality of the parts together arranged as an organization. Knowing that the whole is more or different 
than the sum of parts. So for example, when you look at a face, you can know the meaning of the eyes of the in, the in the face, the nose, the mouth, the forehead, the hair. But at the same time, you also can grasp the meaning of the face, the entirety of the face, the entirety of the image. We can look at an image of a person and recognize and appreciate that this image is not the person, that we are not looking at the person. We are looking with the image, with the help of the image, and we are looking at uh, a person who is being represented in this image. We can also appreciate other historical totalities, historical gestalts, historical threats that this ex experience of viewing a work of art belongs in. So we can appreciate that our viewing of this uh, Mona Lisa painting is one instance of, that belongs to a long history of viewing interactions with this or thinking thoughts about this work of art and appreciations of Da Vinci's larger body of work. The reason why it is significant, we can think about where the original painting is located, the history of its preser preservation and all that, all that, all those are parts of a, a totality that we can move to, we can think in, uh, in, in holistic terms about the work of art, about the nature of art, and we can zoom back in and focus on details, features, shapes, and colors in, uh, that are more concrete in this. So that's the, pro that's the compositionality, uh, the compositional character of human intelligence. The fact that we can appreciate the distinctions between parts and wholes, we can appreciate and respond to, think with, both aspects, limits of associationism. Another approach is the Turing approach, which is very close to behaviorism. So Alan Turing is effectively in line with a kind of behaviorism. Doesn't matter how uh, a form of intelligence behavior is achieved, as long as the behavior can achieve, let's say, an imitation. The imitation game should be, should be successful. And the, the method, the way to, uh, to succeeding is less important or of secondary importance. So winning a game against a human is uh, an instance of intelligence, regardless of how that uh, machine is playing that game. So it's about behaving intelligently. Some people have criticized a strict behaviorist approach to AI as well, including Roger Penrose, including John Serrell. They have said that a, the, an, out, the, an outward sign of intelligence is, is different from the inner processes that enable that outward superficial appearance of intelligence. John Serrell is very well known for uh, the Chinese room argument. Uh, there is a person inside this imaginary Chinese room who is uh, diligently and very accurately following a rule book and interacting with people outside the room. He receives some Chinese symbols and in response to these Chinese symbols, he gives some symbols back according to that rule book. And Cyril asks, should we claim that this person, this man inside the Chinese room knows Chinese? And the answer is obviously no. John Cyril is an important person for his discussions of rules in general. In addition to the book that I just showed you, Cyril has another book on the construction of uh, social reality. And in that book, he distinguishes between two kinds of rules, two fundamentally different kinds of rules. The first he calls regulatory rules. And these are um, like the rules of traffic, the rules of fighting. Regulatory rules don't create the activity. They regulate it. So you can drive without uh, rules of traffic. Even if there are no rules of fighting, even if there are no rules for driving, driving and fighting can take place. But there are, in contrast, constitutive rules, rules that constitute the activity. And without these rules, the activity itself will evaporate, will not exist. These include the rules of chess, the rules of basketball, the rules of language. So language is. What is language without the rules of language? The rules of language will not say, 
don't break these rules, you will be fined. Uh, the rules of language are implicitly saying that if you don't follow these rules, you will not make sense. You are not participating in language. The rules of chess are saying, if you want to stay within this activity, if you want other people to recognize your activity as chess playing, you should follow these rules of chess. If you're not following, then people will say, he's doing his own thing, he's not playing chess. So constitutive rules versus regulatory rules. And humans are very good at distinguishing these two and acting with these, uh, based on these two. We are very sensitive. Human babies can detect uh, regulatory rules and norms very quickly without much instructions, without uh, adults always necessarily telling them these are the rules you have to follow. Children tend to detect and punish cheaters, for example, in a game. Uh, they can detect fairness, fair, fair treatment of fellow players in a game. And children detect and generalize rules of language without much explicit instructions. Of course, these ways of detecting and generalizing based on rules are similar to the more recent methods of machine learning and the machine learning approach to AI. But humans are very flexible with their understanding of rules and norms. When people see a violation of a rule or a violation of a norm, they are more likely to also violate rules or norms, not just that particular norm, but other, other norms. So we detect not just the presence of norms, but the degree to which norms could be treated in a, in a, flexible, in a, in a flexible way. Remember something we talked about in a previous video in this series. I said that when teachers expect higher performance on the part of a particular student, those particular students do perform better. This is something that is difficult to imagine in relation to AI. Can AI enter into relationship in a way that a child enters into a relationship with an adult? That relationship that the child enters into with the adult is not a relationship of someone receiving instruction from another person. It's a relationship of uh, beliefs and exchanges of beliefs. The child is tacitly uh, treating the adult and receiving beliefs from the adults and trying based on the position that the adult is giving to this child, trying to fulfill some of those beliefs and some of those expectations. So the child is acting, uh, acting out the belief that if you think I can do this test or if I can perform uh, really well in this, in this task, then I'll do it. And if not, then the child will not believe it and will not fulfill the belief. So this is a really strange uh, observation in human life, human intelligence, the expression of human intelligence. And it shows how relational it is, how sensitive it is to the other agents related also to the placebo effect. One last thing I want to mention is the question of information. So when we talk about AI, a very closely related topic is information. And the question can, can be raised is what is information? And, and is it important for psychology? I used to, when I used to teach cognitive psychology, introduction to cognitive psychology, I used to talk about this question, question of information and, and highlight uh, how little cognitive psychologists and psychologists in general how little they pay attention to this concept of information, not just using it. Of course, people use information in, in their discussions of various things, but that doesn't mean that if you ask them what it means that they can give, it, give you a definition. Two landmark papers that shed some light on the notion of intelligence, especially in uh, psychology, these two landmark papers were uh, written by William Hick and Ray Hyman. Although these are both classic papers in cognitive science, you might be interested to know that uh, Ray Hyman wrote this paper while he was still in graduate school. He wrote it, published it in 1953, and it was his, his second article. The impression that we get from a line of thought that began, line of the research that began with Hick and Hyman, Hick Hyman Law, is that information, at least in psychology, 
doesn't make sense except with uh, respect to or with reference to particular questions. So you have information only if you have directly or indirectly working under the guidance of some questions. If you have no question, then there are no information. You cannot be informed in a meaningful way if you don't care about anything. You can be informed, you can receive information if you have, if you have questions and if you're facing reality armed with those questions that guide you. So for example, let's say I give you multiple choice questions and uh, in one scenario, I give you a question that only has one choice. So I ask you, what is your favorite YouTube series? And choice A is, of course, great ideas in psychology and there are no other choices. And feel free to choose, feel free to choose. So this is a very non-democratic um, multiple choice question. So is dictatorships working this way? And because dictatorships work in this way, they cannot be informed. So if I am a teacher and if I'm giving multiple choice questions to my students and I make it clear that I want specific answers to these questions, one consequence of that, aside from forcing my students to enact those, those answers, another consequence is that I will not learn anything about my students. In general, non-democratic systems don't learn anything from and about the preferences of the people that they're governing. By contrast, if I give you more options to choose from, then I'm, I'm, I can learn about your preferences. So to sum up, what is information? It is something like answers to questions. It's something that reduces uncertainty regarding those questions. And it is something that we gain from um, low probability events. So if a high probability event happens, that high probability event does not have, doesn't contain much information in it. But when a low probability event happens, that brings with it a lot of, it's very informative for us. And of course, this is something um, we can read a lot about uh, among many different places in Nassim Nicholas Taleb's book, The Black Swan. I want to end with a brief discussion of schemas. Schemas are activities that are organized based on relatively abstract concepts, like going on a date, like watching a movie with your friends, like uh, going to the office to do a day, a day of work. Not only are human beings good at detecting schemas, acting according to schemas, but they are also good at switching between schemas. Switching from you know, a, a less formal meeting to a to an intimate setting of friends drinking beer and watching a game together, to very formal setting of a work workplace. We are good at detecting and switching between schemas. AI has been really good at working within schemas, doing, for example, reading images and detecting cancer, doing some kind of forecast, weather forecast, and so on and so forth, playing chess, go. What is What has been more challenging is this switching between different kinds of tasks, different schemas. And in fact, in my book, Experimental Psychology and Human Agency, I uh, devote an entire chapter to uh, the nature of a task, what, it, what is a task. So chapter three uh, and chapter five are related to this general topic from a psychological standpoint. All right, uh, I think that's good for today. Um, the general style of thinking that I wanted to leave you with was this iterative approach, this iterative interaction with questions related to AI, methods of AI, outcomes of AI, approaches to AI, and what they reveal about human intelligence and what they reveal about our assumptions about human intelligence. This is why, this is the way we can be interested in, we can be curious about artificial intelligence as students of psychology. Um, next time, we will get to stages of development or stage models of human development. Thanks a lot for your, in, uh, for your attention and until next time.